Well, great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, glad you could join the, uh, the webinar. So my name is Jeff Garris. I'm a professor of geological sciences at Stanford. And uh, in general, my research interest is um, in general about earth resources, exploration, all the way to uh, appraisal and then exploitation. And so the interest for me is in water, um, minerals, storage, oil and gas, and things like that. So um, recently I published a, a book about this uh, called Quantifying Uncertainty in Earth and Subsurface Systems. So uh, my work focuses largely on subsurface, but um, a lot of the material that we, you'll hear applies to basically all kinds of Earth systems. And so the challenge that you know, we're all having is food, water, energy, materials, where will it all come from? And so in, in the appraisal and exploitation of such resources, there's always a question of risk versus return, which is the resource versus the environment. Um, ex the uh, exploitation of groundwater, for example, is a, a good example where uh, you may have um, an extraction that may damage the environment due to contaminants entering the groundwater system. So that's also why I want to start just kind of as a leading example. I've been very, very much involved with the managing of the groundwater system uh, in Denmark. And, um, and there, uh, the idea is for the Danish government to uh, protect the Danish uh, groundwater system and to essentially um, manage the aquifer extraction. So to do that in Denmark, we have a very complicated subsurface system, which are the glaciated valley system. And this is all these uh, lines that you see on the left. These black lines are essentially valleys in which the groundwater uh, resides. And so to manage that, the Danish government has mandated a very large um, exploration by means of uh, what's called SkyTem and TTEM um, geophysical data. And these are your examples of that. Uh, SkyTem is a kind of a helicopter system that uh, has a transmitter loop that measures the subsurface electrical resistivity and to then to get more detailed information at the really sort of agricultural scale, uh, they use this um, dragging of that system on the ground. And here you see actually my student, Li Jing Rang, who um, is um, doing that last summer in, in, in collaboration with the uh, University of Aarhus. So the major challenge, of course, for them is, is how do you apply that at such a large scale? How do you manage these groundwater systems? How are you going to use science, in particular, all these fields that are involved from hydrogeology uh, to geophysics, to geostatistics and decision science, uh, and, and, and do that in a scientific fashion? So what's needed here is um, decision science, um, which is a way of addressing opaque decision questions into actual quantitative science. Uh, what's also needed is a way of reasoning about uncertainty because of course the decision is going to be made not based on a deterministic uh, outcome but based on uncertainty. So how do we reason about that? And what are them based on that reasoning, what are the methods of solving such problem, such problems um, for decision making under uncertainty? And of course the whole data part, right, is that so much data is acquired either by stream flow gauges, by measurements through geophysics uh, and drill holes. And so what I wanna to present to you is a scientific uh, view of this problem and also uh, something that has some kind of uh, logic to it. And so what we wanna avoid uh, as much as possible is doing ad hoc things like tuning or fudging with the models to make them match observations. We wanna avoid these kind of things. My experience with that is that works in terms of the tuning, but down the road um, that often hurts you in terms of your models are no longer predicting your observations, your future observations. So um, I've developed over the last uh, um, 25 years expertise in that area um, in, in earth resources and uncertainty quantification, geostatistics. And so I come up with this uh, protocol, uh, which I call Bayesian Evidential Learning. And so we'll talk about this protocol uh, during this presentation. So what is Bayesian evidential learning? As you notice, there are three words in there, Bayesian, evidential, and learning. Uh, Bayesianism, it's based on Bayesianism. I'm sure many of you heard about Bayes rule in, in, in school or in, in courses, but Bayesianism is a slightly um, broader. So Bayes rule was invented about 250 years ago 
visionism is a way of reasoning about uh, data and uncertainty and is generally used in science uh, in that sense. And it's only been around really for 50 years. And what is really key about visionism is this fundamental notion of prior knowledge, which is that we already know something about what is going on prior to even acquiring data. And so that initial knowledge, that initial uncertainty is going to be fundamental in what we're doing. And it's going to be fundamental in coming up with a systematic way of quantifying uncertainty. Obviously, we're going to uh, require evidence, which is data provided uh, by field observation, but also data provided or information provided through modeling. The learning part will be the statistical part, and I will not talk too much about the statistical details. I'll just point out some uh, code at the end uh, of the presentation. But in general, we will be doing Monte Carlo, which is the only way to get to an uncertainty quantification in the most general sense, and we're going to learn from that Monte Carlo. And so, uh, so that's the kind of idea. As I mentioned, this is not really new uh, in that sense that this kind of idea has been developed over many, many, many case studies that I've worked in all these kind of earth resources fields. So let's go through this protocol. So what Bayesian evidential learning is, it's not a methodology uh, in that sense. It doesn't say what to do. It just tells you what is the framework within which you need to do things. And then within that framework, you can make decisions about certain methods to use uh, for example, for sensitivity analysis or inverse modeling. But what's really key is that it's a goal-oriented framework. That means you need to start with formulating this decision question and st statement of what it is actually you want to predict in the future, because that's what your decisions are going to be based on. Uh, the next step is that Bayesian step, is that we're looking at this uh, question and we're starting to think about uh, what are the kind of models that we need to build, what is our model complexity, and what are already initial uncertainties or prior uncertainties. And so here we don't need to be very accurate. The whole point of this is not to be accurate. The whole point is, is really to be broad and have a large range of uncertainties already present. And so what will come next or will come later is that we'll reduce these uncertainties uh, with data. One the next step is probably one of the most important steps in earth sciences is that what we often find is that future mo the models can often not predict future data. And so in order to avoid that, because that's a, of course, first of all, that's not e effective. And secondly, it's not efficient because you have to redo everything, is that we want to go through a process which is called falsification. So falsification is a concept in science that tells that you can only prove things wrong. You cannot prove things right. Now, I'd like to make a, um, a differentiation here between falsification and other uh, nomenclature that's often used, which is validation and verification. So falsification is, is basically not trying to make anything valid, it's trying to make things invalid. And so I think this makes this clear distinction of what is often and commonly done. Once our model is falsified, we're more confident uh, that we can go on, uh, that we'll make meaning meaningful uncertainty quantifications. The next step is really a learning step. Um, once we've done Monte Carlo, there's lots to do with it. Um, first of all, there's a, a global sensitivity analysis. And global sensitivity analysis is very different from local sensitivity analysis or base case sensitivity analysis. We'd like to understand really what is important to make predictions because we're going to base our decisions on predictions in the future. So what is really impacting in the model about predictions? And the second step then is what is impacting the data because if there's some overlap in the data sensitivity and the prediction sensitivity, then logically our data has value and we can start using it. Then comes the uncertainty reduction step, which is probably something that you're also familiar with or inverse modeling. You notice that the inverse modeling mostly really comes at the fifth place. We don't start with inverse modeling. If you start with inverse modeling, often um, you have this issue uh, that either the inverse modeling is too difficult to solve or that you're solving it and you really don't know whether you have a right solution. And so here we now come arrive at the stage where we can be confident in applying inverse modeling. And then finally, we may make our decision, obviously. So coming back to the Danish case, um, let's uh, see how this can work. So what we want to do is first, of course, is formulate the decision question. So here we go to a smaller area in Denmark, uh, which is near Aarhus. And in that small area here, um, we'd like to decide where to drill the next drinking water well. And so that's, uh, let's say that four 
alternatives have been given to us, uh, location A, B, C, or D. So that's basically the, the question is like, where would you drill if for, for, for alternatives? And how would you now solve this problem? So here we have a number of observations, which is typically done in groundwater is, is pumping wells or observation wells where we measure uh, the groundwater level. And here at the bottom, you see the SkyTem resistivity data, um, which indicates, as you notice, this um, very heterogeneous uh, subsurface system uh, of varied valleys. So you see a um, significant variation in the resistivity in the subsurface, which indicates a uh, significant change in water content and grain size. So this is really what we're uh, talking about is what is the problem you want to address and how would you like to solve it? So in decision science, uh, we will first formulate objectives. Um, in the beginning of the presentation, I talked about risk versus return. And so typically you would have risk objectives uh, and return objectives. So there's a risk, of course, when we drill and pump that we contaminate the groundwater system uh, because of inflow of pollutants from uh, agriculture or industry in Denmark. The second is that by pumping, you risk um, draining wetlands <clears throat> and also draining uh, streams. And so that's another risk. The return, of course, then is that uh, we get do get the groundwater extraction, the drawdown, and uh, we'd like to, uh, of course, maximize that to obtain uh, the groundwater uh, for drinking. So, so each of those will have associated with them some kind of a variable, uh, which is the prediction variable that we'd like to uh, predict. Uh, the nature of this variable here and how it's done is not really important, but you can imagine, for example, for industry in dust, here would be the amount of contamination that is uh, obtained um, be because the overlap of the catchment zone with industrial um, land cover. So in the end, what we would like to then do is, is to evaluate these objectives with each alternative. Uh, now, some objectives more score, some alternatives may score well on certain objectives. Uh, it really depends, and that's what we want to estimate. Now, once we have that, then we can start um, sort of uh, summing this all up and coming up with our best uh, location to drill. But we don't know this. We don't know these values, and, and this will be part of modeling. And so we need to predict these values at each location, and all these values are subject to uncertainty. Okay. So now, of course, we move to the second point. We sort of get an understanding of what we want to do. We now want to conceptualize our Earth in all of its aspects. And we want to look at what does the community already know about it. It's not that we start from zero here. Obviously, uh, people have studied glaciated valleys before. People have acquired uh, um, geophysical data in glaciated valleys before. People have ideas of resistivity uh, and how it varies, uh, uh, et cetera. People have ideas of how much rainfall there is in, in Denmark. So there's a lot of things we already know, and that will determine that balance together with what we want to predict balances that conceptualization in terms of what is the complexity and what's the uncertainty. So that's what I uh, mean here is that we want to define model complexity. We'll call that M, it's a big vector, let's call it like that. Of all of the model variables and components that we have, this is huge, and all of the uncertainties a priori. So there is no observations, no tuning, just make broad statements about things. And this needs to be done for all of the fields jointly. So you can imagine this, if you go to real scale application, you have to do that for many, many types of fields of science involved. Just to give you an idea of how this can proceed, I'm just going to talk about a little bit of another type of case studies, and in the in the webinar, we'll sort of in the min, intermingle a little bit a couple of other case studies just for you to get an understanding of what the generality of what we're talking about. So here we are in a geothermal exploration in the Basin Range in the United States, and so we're here in this valley called Dixie Valley, which is as you notice in Nevada. And so in these valleys, what we often have is that uh, over time, meteoric water has infiltrated the subsurface created um, a cycle of heating and cooling that then led to the creation of these um, hot springs, which are then sources for potentially uh, or indications of sources of geothermal energy. The problem, however, is that um, 
these hot springs or these types of observations cannot be made direct simply because these valleys are very much covered by sediment. And so we need to do exploration drilling. And so exploration drilling is very expensive. Uh, so we want to limit our exploration drilling. And then the other problem, of course, is exploration drilling is only shallow. It's only probably uh, one or two kilometers at best, uh, or potentially even less, while the actual geothermal production wells are uh, much deeper. So in this case, what is then the prior information? Is it just kind of a few drill? Um, well, the answer is no, because we have well studied already these kind of valleys. We know that they are extensional systems. So that means create these kind of uh, faults, these um, setting of normal and Y faults. We know that the basin has been filled in. We have extensive information elsewhere in the United States about the fill of this basin. We have a lot of information also about the permeability of the basin rock, uh, sorry, the basement rock, which is of course a very low permeability, but still, uh, people all over the world have drilled in very deep uh, perm permeable systems, so there's a lot of information about that. Uh, then we have geophysical information that may uh, inform us about the density variations and what can be expected. So all, all of this I, uh, was compiled into this table. So this table is now our statement of prior model uncertainty and prior uncertainty. So Typically in a subsurface view, uh, it's a big table, I'm not gonna go into details, but typically uh, when you build models, there are structural components, at least in the subsurface, uh, rocks and, and flu fluids. So structural meaning faults and layers. And so here you see that there are several uncertainties. There's also distributions and established from the kind of data that we have. And of course, so of course getting to this table is, is a very, um, well, tedious and laborious um, work, but it's a very important work. Uh, what's, however, also important is not to worry too much about these distributions. We're not looking here, say, to estimate in detail what is the basin depth. We're saying here, for example, if you look at the first row, we're saying it's between three and four kilometers. So we're not going to say it's 3.258 kilometers plus or minus some standard deviation. We're looking at really broad ranges. Uh, shouldn't worry about that because later on these ranges will be significantly reduced once we acquire or go into, into inverse model. So what we then do is define what we call the data variable, which is um, the, not to be confused with the observations. The data variable is simply taking a model and applying the data for model, which is in this case the temperature uh, modeled into the system. And so to model the temperature in the system we're going to use some physical model. In this case, would be uh, heat and uh, permeability system. Uh, uh, and so we use, for example, conformal multiphysics. So take that model that's at the bottom there and run it through a simulator, and then we get the temperature distribution in the basin. And we can then drill and uh, acquire the temperature in those wells. So the picture on the right hand side is a very favorable picture, obviously, for geothermal exploration because you notice that you get this upwelling of um, essentially the um, let's see if I could get a pointer going here mm. the options there yeah see the upwelling here uh, that's very favorable of course that is true if this particular model would happen but we don't know the model the only thing we, we know is just a few observations and so then we are ready to do Monte Carlo is taking that big table and starting drawing from each variable one realization or one sample and then we have one model and we repeat that and so we have then a number of realizations held here and you see that you get a large variety of realizations uh, and so you can start now to understand that inverting a model like that with observations is going to be become rather complex in the Danish case uh, similar um, and and summarized here, we have a little logical uncertainty. We don't know where the gravel is, where the buried valleys are exactly. We have some information from geophysics, but not perfectly. We don't know permeabilities, permeabilities within the area we're modeling, and also permeabilities on the boundary of the area we model. We have river flows and conductances. We have drains that are built in the system. We have aquifer recharge, which is itself can be a complex uh, variable in the sense you have to model rainfall uh, over time in Denmark, it rains a lot, so that's not uh, so hard. And also in Denmark, the groundwater system sits pretty much at the surface. 
So, but again, you see, we need a lot of expertise uh, in doing that. So you would typically have to collaborate with a number of people of different fields of expertise. So this is kind of a summary of what Monte Carlo then entails. Monte Carlo entails making that table, which is that box here uh, in the middle, then creating multiple realizations of the model, then forward simulating the model, getting the, uh, the data variables, which is these realizations here, simulating also the future, which we'll call H, uh, and creates this here. And then we also have the actual observations. Good. One thing, a little technical note here I will talk about is how do we visualize Monte Carlo runs? Because we're creating a lot of information. We have a lot of complex models, data, and predictions. So how do we visualize that? Some of you probably heard about dimension reduction. One of the basis, basic idea of dimension reduction is the following, is that we can take anything, an object, a vector, which could be a model, a data variable, a prediction variable, and write as a linear combination of nonlinear functions. And so this linear combination of nonlinear function is like fixed shapes and then scalars. Uh, one form of doing that is principal component analysis. In principal component analysis, these nonlinear functions are called eigenvectors. And we can write then, say, for example, a model or whatever it is, an image in this particular case, as a linear combination of these basis vectors. And so these basis vectors, as you know, this increase in frequency. You can see it's like, basically, it's like an, a, a Fourier decomposition. And so what this does, it's nice about this, is that instead of now focusing on X, we can now focus on the alphas. And so the alphas are contributions, essentially, to the eigenvector. So they have certain variances that are interesting. Alpha 1 will have the largest variance, alpha 2 then the second largest, etc. And what we can then do is plot alphas with regard to each other. For example, here I plot alpha 1 with respect to alpha 2 for, let's say, 1,000 of these x's when I have to 1,000 models. So this two-dimensional plot is now a sort of, sort of simple way of visualizing the Monte Carlo. And this is very useful later on. We'll see that then we can start color coding these dots with certain properties and allows us to make some more better visual understanding of what we have achieved in the Monte Carlo. Here's an example um, of how Monte Carlo can be used. This is another case uh, that, I, that is uh, discussed in the book, and it's about reactive transport models. So here we're in Colorado, um, uh, where we have the Colorado River. And so one of the problems in Colorado is uranium contamination, which is due to the dumping of waste of uh, nuclear material uh, of mining. Uh, right next to the river and the floodplains. And so people, of course, want to clean that up. And so what they do is they inject uh, certain um, acetate, which is a chemical in the subsurface to precipitate the uh, uranium. Of course, that precipitation process is uncertain. We don't know whether it works. And so what we do is we run models uh, to evaluate how effective that is. And so on the right-hand side, you see reactive transport models, which are crunch flow models. And what you notice here is that we have injected a fluid, for example, here on this side of injectors. So these are these injector sites you see here. And so by injecting a fluid, you see that you're starting to precipitate the uranium as the fluid moves through from the left to the right. So this concentration here is in a concentration of immobilized uh, uranium. So you notice that this is really, really nice. This is a good system. It seems to have worked, but here it doesn't seem to have worked. Work. And so we want to understand what factors are involved. Is it permeability? Is it the reaction rates? Is, is it the microbial activity? So many uncertainties. So we've done this Monte Carlo. We created many of these maps. And so one thing, these are the various uncertainties that went to it. In this case, we have not only geological uncertainties, but also geochemical uncertainties, uh, which have to do with the reaction rates, the concentrations, uh, mineral surface area, etc. So for example, here you see uh, one particular um, reaction, uh, sorry, one particular saturation of immobilized re uranium. And so when we do principal component analysis of that, we can take this very complex picture. And essentially, as you notice, if we use 100, eigen, uh, one, sorry, 100 of these alpha scores, we get pretty much something that looks exactly like our input picture. So that means that we have reduced the problem of tens of thousands of pixels 
in this image into a problem of only 100 values. So now our problem becomes not a problem of 10,000 variables, but a problem of 100 variables. And that for, of course, for a mathematician or statistician or a data scientist, becomes suddenly much more attractive. So you can also do that in the data variables. For example, in Denmark, we have in that area 300 observation wells with uh, head data, which is basically the water level. Uh, we also have stream flow data. You see here this uh, green dot, which is essentially where you measure stream flow. And so what we can do is we can also put that in the principal component analysis, and then we get essentially um, a plot like this. So each dot comes from a model that I created with my big table. Remember, I started with my big table, created a model, ran my simulator, in this case, this is mod flow, created a response, then the dimension reduction. So each dot in here is essentially a response that I get from my model. What's really interesting when you do this in the data world is that you can also do this on the observations because you can do the same kind of transformation on the actual pumping data or actual observation data. And so you notice here, the star here is the actual observations. So an ob important observation, of course, here is that that star is in the middle of this cloud of blue points. It's not outside this cloud of blue points. This is very important because obviously when that star is outside the cloud of that blue points, what does that really mean? It means that my model that I created, my table, my uncertainties, is never going to be able to predict the observations. And so that's a critical observation. And that's the observation that leads us to falsification. If that star is way outside that cloud, it means that your model is falsified. And then we have to think about what we should do next. Okay. As I said, falsification doesn't mean proving anything correct or validatable, calibrated or verified. It's simply a process that says you have proven something incorrect and you need to revise. So the revision is very important because what we don't want to do now is tune. We don't want to sort of take the model and multiply a variable with five or, or fix something or try to change something uh, in an, a meaningful fashion. Because what, what do we really mean by the model is falsified and why does that happen? And there's really only three reasons why that can happen and that is explained here. Either your model is not complex enough and you need to add complexity because there's, there's something lacking in your model. Or your model is complex enough but the variables are not uncertain enough. You cannot really capture the ranges that are there. And so instead of trying to tune and invert and calibrate, we need to increase complexity or increase uncertainty or do both. And so that means you have to go back to your table and revise. And this is not a statistical question. This is a question of understanding why is this happening? And in order to do that, we can start using sensitivity analysis. So that's where I've landed now. If our model needs revision, we can do sensitivity analysis. Or if our model has been revised and passed through the falsification, we need to do sensitivity analysis to understand better the problem. So here we're talking about Monte Carlo or global-based sensitivity analysis. That is, we're just going to use, again, the Monte Carlo results that we already created and run a sensitivity analysis. What we're not going to do is take a model and make small perturbations to it, like one at a time analysis. That is called a local-based sensitivity analysis and should not be used for uncertainty quantification. In the sensitivity analysis, what do we want to learn? We want, as I mentioned before, we want to learn what in the model variables impacts most my prediction. Because if model varies, no matter how they vary, for example, no matter how I vary the recharge variable, it doesn't have any impact. Then I don't have to worry about the recharge variable. I don't have to bother with it. And that is gonna allow us to simplify the whole problem. So sensitivity analysis, a lot is about simplification. The second part of sensitivity analysis is about what I call value of information. If you will find now do a sensitivity analysis and understand what model variables impact the data response. Then we can start to understand if there's an overlap with those model variables that impact the prediction, then logically, then the data is informative about the prediction. And we can actually tell what in the data is informative about the prediction. 
And that is extremely useful information for us to just start doing inversion and do it very efficiently. So if you do this in the Danish groundwater system, what you're finding, for example, is I will look at the data variables. You might do global sensitivity analysis. And typically what comes out of these global sensitivity analysis are these types of Pareto plots. So in a Pareto plot, what we do is we rank the variables from most sensitive to least sensitive. And so if you look at what impacts the data variable, in other words, the same, what that says is, what does the data inform? We see that on the top is the recharge and the budget. Budget means essentially the budget of water coming into that region. So this has to do with boundary condition of that region. So what is surprisingly not important is the permeability, hydraulic connectivity, and geological heterogeneity. So in other words, the stream flow and head data is mostly sensitive to things that are flowing, not to things that are geological. That also means that I can only use the data to reduce uncertainty on those variables. I cannot use the stream flow data to reduce uncertainty on hydraulic connectivity. If I look, however, on the prediction side, and this is the right-hand side here, then we see that in terms of predicting industrial pollution, which is essentially calculating the overlap of the drainage area or uh, of, of a well with regard to uh, land cover uh, intersecting with industry, then we notice it's a bit more complex. There are more sensitivities, and there are sensitivities related to boundary conditions as well as geological heterogeneity and permeability. So what can we conclude from this? What we conclude from this is that the one, the data is informative about the prediction because we have overlapping sensitivities, the blue box, but the data is not fully informative about uh, prediction because there is areas that the data is not informed by. So it means that I have to model geological heterogeneity and potentially I could use other data to constrain geological heterogeneity. For example, in Denmark, we would use geophysical data to do that, obviously, to get a better handle on the, uh, the buried valleys. That's why in Denmark, the geophysical data is extremely valuable, potentially even more valuable than the flow data, hydraulic head, uh, sort of head and stream flow data. So good, we arrived now at this point where we want to do uncertainty reduction. We've created many models, they're not matching observations, but we've used those models to understand better what's going on. We have falsified the models in the first place and we've calculated sensitivity. So now we're ready to do this uncertainty reduction. Often this is very challenging because uncertainty reduction requires inverse modeling, means using the observations to reduce uncertainty on the variables. And there are many uncertainty resources here. Right? We talked about boundary conditions, sky tent data, blood uncertainties, rock physics models, uncertainties, reactive biological models, uncertainties, etc. So inverse modeling can often be challenging. That's why there are two ways of looking at this problem. One is called model inversion, and the second is called direct forecasting. So in model inversion, we're going to reduce uncertainty on the model variables with data. So you notice in this slide, this part here, we do that first. Then second, we're going to use the uh, models that have been matched to observations to make predictions. In many cases, in practice, this doesn't work very well, simply because there are too many uncertainties. The second one is that the uh, forward functions, simulators, things like that, way take way too long to evaluate. I've been involved with simulators that take a week to evaluate. Uh, just one evaluation. So this idea of inversion is not going to work very well. An alternative is to establish something different. We have to recognize that we, what we already did is we have done Monte Carlo. We have created multiple realizations of model. From that, we have created multiple realizations of the data variables and the prediction variables. So another more modern approach is to do machine learning between those two, is to learn the data from the prediction variable. Once we have that regression relationship, then we can use the actual observation to directly reduce uncertainty on the prediction variables. There's two important points to that. First of all, there's no models being inverted. And secondly, you directly get the answer you want on which the predictions are going to be based, which is the prediction variable. So 
in terms of inversion and direct forecasting, uh, there's sort of these two ways. In terms of inversion, inversion is still possible in many situations, but we have to really be careful in applying this. What we want to do is not being optimization or stochastic optimization, genetic algorithms, or any of these kind of things. The reason for that is that you do not apply Bayes rules. If you want to do a proper scientific uncertainty quantification, at some point you have to use Bayes rule. There's no way around this. Otherwise, you're not using the prior information in a proper sense. The only really rigorous way of doing Bayes rule and inversion is called Markov chain Monte Carlo. These are beautiful ideas and techniques. However, in practice, they become very difficult to apply simply because they just take an enormous amount of formal evaluations. That's why I'm more um, a proponent of what is called approximate Bayesian computation. We're not going to do this rigorous Bayes Monte Carlo inversion. We're going to do this in an approximate sense. And what we also want to be focusing on is to try to make the whole process faster. And one thing way of make the process faster is by called statistical surrogate models that allows us to do much faster evaluations of the model rather than running into the physical model every time. In direct forecasting, uh, we do the same. We establish that relationship and then we use base rule but now between data and prediction not between model and data. Again, we can use the statistical surrogate models. So why Bayes' rule? Well, in Bayes' rule, if you do inversion, you want to get the posterior uncertainty of your model given the observation. So we know this is a function of the prior and the likelihood, as you see here on that side. The problem with uh, the full Bayes part is that in order to do it rigorous, you have to account for this relationship between that and that. And so in order to do that, you have to come up with this full likelihood function which is very difficult to obtain. And it also uh, requires running a lot of uh, physical model evaluations. So the full Bayesian approach is often not done. What is done is then in a set is called a large family of methods that are called likelihood free methods or approximate Bayesian competition. It's a very, very simple idea. It's simply saying you have your prior, we have done Monte Carlo, we have falsified the prior, possibly simplify the prior using sensitivity analysis. So what we're gonna do now is draw realizations from the prior models. We evaluate those models. If those models are close to my observation, then I accept the model, otherwise I reject the model. So that, as you notice, is very simple, but maybe very difficult to apply because what you're, what you're counting on here is that by chance, I create a model that matches the observations. So that chance obviously is very small, maybe one in 1,000, one in 10,000. So obviously we want this function here to be very fast. And that's why we'd like to use surrogate models. Here's just a, another um, proof essentially of saying how, why Bayesian, uh, approximate Bayesian competition actually is a formulation of Bayes' rule um, that's more described in detail in the book. So surrogate models. Surrogate models, is essentially trying to come up with something that replaces the function evaluations. And it does require some form of training. That means we're gonna generate a bunch of models, forward simulate those models, and then calculate the mismatch, which is the distance. And we'd like to understand what is the mismatch, the function or the relationship between this mismatch and the model parameters. So that's where we build some kind of a machine learning surrogate model. Uh, a common, sorry, I'm gonna go over here, skip on that. A common surrogate model is called CART, which stands for classification and regression trees. There's variations on CART that involves bootstrap and they're called random FARs. And so you've probably heard about these terms if you've taken a machine learning course, even, even just uh, out there. So CART and random FARs. Why are these such interesting me methods? because they don't require any parameters, unlike neural networks where you have to train and validate and cross-validate. You have all these problems with uh, overfitting. CART is a more problem of underfitting. And so it's a very interesting model in that sense. And there's more about CART, of course, than, than I could talk about. But the other thing about what's really nice about CART is that it provides you a sensitivity analysis. So what you see here on the right is for the Danish case, the sensitivity analysis to the mismatch to the data. 
This is different from what we showed before. Previously, we showed a sensitivity analysis to the data variable itself. Here we saw a sensitivity analysis to the mismatch of the data. So again, of course, we see that uh, this budget and recharge of important variables. So what I have now is a very simple statistical model that I can evaluate in a matter of milliseconds that given any of these model parameters, and there are many, many, it will tell me directly without running the physical model, what is the mismatch that I have with my observations. This means I can run this model millions and millions of times. That means I can plug it into approximate Bayesian computation and start evaluating things. Here you see that we get a good training set, uh, which of course is the mismatch predicted with card versus the mismatch uh, that I actually have. And we would do some kind of out of sample validation to do that. So once you have that, now you run approximate Bayesian computation. And what approximate Bayesian computation now outputs is the posterior uncertainty of all of the model variables. And so what we are expecting is that those model variables that were sensitive to data, which we already know, that's our global sensitivity analysis, will be reduced in uncertainty. And that's what we see here. You have that red curve, which is the posterior, and the black curve is the prior. Variables that were not informed by data will not have a reduction of uncertainty. And this is critical. This is the application of Bayes' rule. If you use other methods, such as optimization, genetic algorithms, and all the things that are out there, you will get an uncertainty reduction in variables that are not informed by data because it violates Bayes' rule in many cases. Once we have that, we evaluate now the future. We again use card that's among going to details of that, and we get an updated uncertainty of all of the prediction variables. For example, on this side here, you see that I get an updated uncertainty on what would be the industrial pollution if I drill in location C. What would be the stream, the, the drainage of the stream flow if I drill at location A? And you see that you get uh, a significant update in the uncertainty of that prediction variable. Once we have that uncertainty, then we can start making this decision tape. I'm not going to go at all into, into the details of this. There's a lot to talk about, and many of you are not involved in decision science. But basically, what we're doing here is using all of these results that we just talked about of the uncertainty reduction and coming up with some kind of a way of evaluating what is the best decision. And so here you notice that um, we have a decision that says that is location D scores the highest. We can also look at trade-off. We can, of course, see that uh, we can evaluate risk versus return. Uh, for example, in the book, we describe how location B D has a better return, but a much lower uh, risk, a uh, higher risk. So if you want to balance that, then maybe loc location A is better. OK, let's skip over that. Uh, and I think I'm coming towards the end. Um, there's a lot of reference material. Um, first of all, there's the book uh, by Wiley, which led us last year. I also have a YouTube channel um, where I just search my name and YouTube. Uh, where there's many um, presentations and, and talks about some of the details of the book as well as other material. And we have also um, a website uh, with a uh, Git repository. There are many uh, repositories to deal with uh, things like global sensitivity analysis, falsification, dimension reduction, uh, direct forecasting. And so feel free to, to browse through that. Uh, there's one specifically related to uh, the book um, that um, was published. Okay, and that's uh, where I'll stop and uh, end here with our slide about Bayesian Adventure Learning, and I'll be happy to take any questions.